<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll be starting our session right now. Uh, welcome to yet in our and uh, Ethiopian Medical Association CME. Uh, so we'll be giving you a little bit introduction about uh, yet in our and then we'll be going to introduce our guest today. Um, joining us to give us a, a session on surgical site infection. And we'll be telling you about the requirements to get the to get the CEU units and the like. So thank you for joining us. you can see my slide. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, INAUG. Um, so INAUG is a volunteer network digital health platform, as you all know it, as you have heard about it. So we try to uh, we try to bridge that. Uh, so we've got, we registered and it's an nonprofit organization registered in Philadelphia. And we are working on uh, registering it in our country. We've got 165 and growing active volunteers. So it is nonprofit and it's run by volunteer uh, volunteers in the Inag across five uh, different uh, countries. So um, so we've got the health promotion part, the community engagement, and mentorship and skill sharing. And for our own CME, um, it's under medical education, as you have heard. So besides, we're more than a digital platform. We try to reach to the societies and we try to donate blood, as you can see, and advocate health. And we also prepared, as you have heard about it, a competition, article writing competition. Uh, and 2023 was uh, out last month so when we come about our uh, when we talk about our cme so it's freely accessible we try to host two uh, sessions per month under the association in collaboration with association like emma in the scp and edbs so today it's made with uh, emma uh, Ethiopian medical association and we invite we know international speakers as you as will we'll be uh, knowing for today's session, and we've heard we have uh, hosted so far 30 CMEs in this year. We have nearly hosted 10 CMEs in 2023, and we plan to have nearly 25 for the rest of the years. Uh, for the rest of the year, focusing on non-communicable diseases, current issues, and mental health, and this HR. So, so you can after the session you can access it on YouTube. Uh, we'll be sharing the Google uh, the the link in the chat box uh, in in a white, and you can join our Telegram channel and you can see updated sessions and you can see the about our upcoming CMEs for this year. And we've been uh, like helped with uh, collaborating with Roha Research Fellowship, which helped us in giving grants for our research uh, programs. And together with Kurambesa, we've been working on research and evidence based medicine. So our mission is to have health advocacy, filling the knowledge gap and networking, and we'll be encouraging uh, local funders as well. So to get the best experience in the webinar today, so try to send your questions in the Q&A box. And at the end of the webinar, we'll be entertaining the questions to our guest speaker. And you'll be getting the C units when you uh, fulfill the set of criteria. For example, you need to attend the whole session virtually, and we can we will be able to see how many minutes you have attended via the Zoom attendee reports. And make sure to fill the Google form, which we'll be sharing after the session. In the Google form, you can find the questions. We have got we've prepared five questions, and if you answer fifty percent of it, we'll be giving you the CEU to the two CEU units, and you the certificates might wait like one to two weeks and be patient with us. But the results you can see it right away. So without further ado, um, let me uh, introduce you today's uh, guest. Our today's guest is Professor Abdullah Bakala. 
Um, he is currently serving as Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and Research Affairs at the University of Global Health Equity, which he has also served as founding dean. And he received his medical and surgical trainings in Gondar Medical School at Sawa, uh, University, as well as College of Surgeons of East and Central South Africa, COSEXA, and Harvard Medical School in uh, health leadership, surgical leadership. He's highly experienced and accomplished medical professional with over 20 uh, 23 years of experience in medical practice and 10 years in surgery. He uh, he, uh, his exp uh, experience spans all well beyond the clinical practice with vast work in medical education, research, and medical leadership. In addition to practicing as a cardiothoracic surgeon, Professor Abel Bekel has held a variety of leadership positions in the medical field. He has served as dean and CEO of the School of Medicine at Addis Ababa University Kurambisa Hospital, and he has also served as editor in chief in chief and educa uh, educational board member of several regional uh, journals as well as research development programs. Professor Abubakar is highly respected and pub and valued researcher. He has over hundred uh, research publications on several national, regional, and prominent international journals. Professor Abubakar uh, is also a passionate educator. I'm sure most of our uh, attendees will share. This comment as well. He has been involved in curriculum development at several institutions, including development of new medical school in University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. He's a man with enormous experience in surgery as well as teaching. He's a valuable asset to the medical community, and I'm honored to welcome him to this CME session. So, Professor Vakala, you can proceed. Thank you for uh, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zaganish. Uh, for the very welcome, for the, for the very kind uh, introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me to join you today to say a few words about uh, <clears throat> this very common surgical disease in the surgical practice, uh, surgical site infections. I have nothing to declare uh, for this talk. I'm just representing myself as a practicing surgeon and, uh, and the Dean of the School of Medicine. So uh, I hope all of you can hear me. I guess uh, we can start. Surgical site infections are uh, one of the common hospital acquired infections in the surgical patients. It's the most common uh, uh, nosocomial infection. However, it is the third most common in all patients admitted to the hospital following UTIs and pneumonia. But when surgical patients are considered, it ranks as the number one to be followed by UTI, catheter associated infections and uh, mild and severe forms of, of pneumonia. 38% of uh, infections acquired by surgical patients are about surgical site infection. In general, uh, co uh, compiled or pooled literature shows 2 to 5% of surgical patients develop surgical site infection. This is the pooled data from the, the globe. I will come to the specific country uh, numbers later. But what's interesting is 60% of these are preventable. If we play our cards right, if we practice surgery well, 60% of these infections are preventable. Uh, medical and surgical related complications are language that we, the practitioners, understand, and maybe the patient understands. However, policymakers and those who control budget and policy understand uh, concepts around expense and hospital stay, prolonged stay. So if you want to convince policymakers around surgical site infection prevention, these are, this is the data you have to pull. So SSIs result in prolongation of a patient's stay by seven to nine days. And on average, $3,800 excess big to treat a surgical infections. This amount exponentially goes to about $20,000 in the US. And it's responsible to three to ten billion dollars of the U.S. healthcare investment annually. The U.S. has the highest GDP investment in health. That's about eighteen to twenty percent. From this, significant proportion goes to surgical site infection uh, uh, treatment. And one third of postoperative death is associated with a surgical site infection. Not only are we concerned about money, uh, prolonged bed stay, and acute complications. In the long run, surgical site infections are pretty bad on patients. 
it, it, they are associated with incisional hernia development. The wound becomes ugly. It does not heal well. It becomes really dark. Uh, it's persistently painful and itchy because of the exaggerated healing after inf infection control. The wound becomes stiff and hence restricts movement. And you can imagine uh, such ugly scars in, a, in an exposed body surface area, like the face, the neck, gives rise to serious emotional uh, distress. So all these are long-term sequelae of, of uh, surgical pathogen infections. This is the reason why we have to understand them and be able to treat them better. I tried to review the literature in preparation for this uh, study and papers from Ethiopia started coming out as early as the 1980s, 1970s. The very first paper was, was by Dr. Uh, Yaswab Dagavur, a microbiologist at the Black Line Hospital, who uh, reported that 59% of all nosocomial infections at the Black Line Hospital were SSIs, were surgical related. Then about uh, 15 years later, another uh, paper came out from Gonder by Professor Brown and uh, Dr. Abraham. They reported a surgical site infection rate of about 21% at the GCMS, at the then Gonder College of Medical Sciences. Seven years later, uh, Dr. Mulat from the Black Line reported infection rate of about 14%. On average, you can see the infection rate of, uh, in Ethiopia documented for the past 20, 30 years is between 14 to 21%. Then I also tried to do uh, look at recent pub publications and about 19 publications are out there. The pool prevalence of surgical site infection in Ethiopia from different authors is between 12.3, uh, 2.6 and 25.2%. However, the pooled SSI rate after C-sections is a bit lower, 8.8 to 9.7%. Let, let us try to, make, uh, to take a, a, a quite a deep look at what the SSI infection looks like. The papers are coming from all over the country, but you can see that they range between as high as 27.6 at, at our hospital and about 8.4% at the D2. So we can fairly say the rates of infection are between 8 to about 30%, depending on where the reports are. And interestingly, many of the data are following cesarean section studies, OBGYN procedures. I also tried to, to, to look at the rates of infection in the country I am in now, in Rwanda. There are two papers recently out. The prevalence of surgical infection is about 10.9, 10.2% into different hospitals. And several predictors of SSI are, are also described here. I'll talk about them later. When you compare this to the global data, 0.9% in the US, 1.4, 1.6% in the EU, about 4.9, 4.6 in England, and about 2.8 in Australia, our surgical site infection in Africa is almost double than what is seen in these high income, high income countries. How do we define SSIs? SSIs are infections at the surgical site between 90 to 360 days. If the surgery involves the usage of an implant, it's within one year of the surgery. If no implant is used, it's within 30 days of the surgery. However, the majority of these infections usually occur in the second and third week. When we were medical students, we were thought as uh, surgical site infections usually occur during the fifth and the sixth day. Something must have happened. Maybe the way we practice infection prevention, the potency of the antibiotics we are using, something must have changed. Uh, current literature uh, states common infections usually occur during the second day and third week. And you can imagine this is when after patients are discharged. Infections usually occur at home, not in the hospital. Based on the location of the infections, infection, uh, SSIs are divided into superficial, deep, and organ space. Superficial, if the infection is limited to above the muscles, that means involving the skin in the subcutaneous tissue, about 70% of SSIs are superficial. 
If the muscle layer and the fascia layer are, are involved, it's called deep. And if the deep organs like the intestine, the peritoneum, the pleura, the knee, the joint space are involved, we call it organ space, SSI. And there are several uh, criteria that the world uses at the moment to define surgical infections. There is one proposed by the WHO, one by the CDC, and several colleges of surgical colleges and infection prevention colleges in, in the US have their own ways of defining SSIs, the criteria. However, almost all of them agree on the following. Superficial SSIs range from overt purulent discharge from the surgical infect, from, from the, the incision site, clear pus coming out, or the presence of organisms from the, super, the, 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 the wound, the presence of one or two of what we call the SRS, and to the extent that the operating surgeon or the GP thinks this wound looks very suspicious. So superficial uh, SSIs are most likely assumed undiagnosed. If the operating physician or the nurse in the hospital thinks is very uncomfortable with what the wound looks like and pronounces the wound as infected, it is probably infected. These images show you a typical picture. The first one is a staple closed abdominal wound with a gaping wound in the lower, lower margin. If you look closely, that area is covered with a very thin pus and blood. It is infected. The second one is a knee joint replacement, clear pus coming out from the wound, clear evidence of infection. And the third, an abdominal scar a wound that's grossly inflamed, very red, very swollen. You can see the suture, the sutures are pulled in the skin and the septentrius edematis in, and sucks the staples in. These are clear and obvious signs of site infection. The second is a deep SSI. Deep SSIs involve the skin, the subcutaneous tissue, the fascia and, and the muscle, but do not extend to the organ uh, cavity. This is defined when there is clear spontaneous dehiscence of the wound with culture positivity, or if the surgeon is suspicious, deliberately opens the wound, cultures it, and it's culture positive. The key word here is it should be culture positive. If there is no apparent sign of infection, no pus, no inflammation, no edema, but if it's just a gaping wound, there should be culture positivity to pronounce it as surgical infected. However, in non-culture patients, if culture is not available, a gaping wound and the presence of SIRS, fever, tachycardia, local pain, local tenderness, can, can augment the, 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 the criteria to diagnose SSIs. Deep is, is obvious. The infection may or may not involve the superficial and deep layers. However, there is clear infection or abscess deep within the cavity of, of the operated space. You can see a deep uh, infection on both sides, both the first and second pictures. And the third is a typical organ space infection. An implant, a uh, long bone plate is completely infected, covered with pus, which is a sign of cavity uh, infections. And this is a typical manifestation of an organ space infection. Laparoscopic view of the pelvis shows the pelvic cavity, the pockets are full of thin pus, the whole intestine inflamed, the patchy tachial, uh, the petechial hemorrhage all over, and uh, the experience uh, I can tell you the mesentery and the peritoneum is thick. A typical example of uh, an organ space infection or an infection. And the CT scan also shows massive collection in front and behind uh, the rectum. So this is a feature of 
uh, deep organ spacing function. Uh, when we dissect it into the uh, classification of SSIs, based on etiology, SSIs can be divided into primary and secondary. Primary, if the wound is the primary site of the infection. Secondary, if the infection arises not from the wound, from, but from somewhere else. If the infection is not related or uh, is not related to the complication of, of the wound, it can be further graded or classified as self-limiting, ma major, or minor. A very severe form of infection might be fulminant or fatal, like, as in gas gangrene, Fournier's gangrene, and synergistic bacterial gangrene. Based on the time of onset, it can be early, within 30 days, intermediate, in, in three months, and late, more than three months. Here you can see that it's only when implant is associated with a surgical site that the 30 days mark is used. So intermediate and late infections are associated with implant-associated SSIs. And as I've said, minor and major classifications are also there. However, in relation to SSIs, all surgical wound is classed as follows. This is mainly to gauge the risk and the prognosis of uh, surgical infection development and, and, and treatment. This is not a classification of SSIs, but this is a, a classification of the surgical wound as class one, two, three, and four. Clean, clean contaminated, contaminated and dirty. One message I would like you to, to catch here is clean wound does not need prophylaxis. Clean contaminated and contaminated, prophylaxis is indicated. In a dirty wound, therapeutic antibiotics are indicated, not prophylaxis. So what do we mean by these three? Clean wounds are the routine wounds that we do in the surgical practice. These involve uh, operation in sterile areas like the heart, the brain, operations in non-inflamed or non-colonized part of uh, the, 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 the GIT or the respiratory tract without entering the cavities. Typical examples include thyroidectomy, mastectomies, mediastinal tumor excision, uh, lipoma excision, hernia repair, and so on. Clean contaminated, you are operating on a cavity that normally contains bacteria. The cavity is entered, but there is no gross contamination. There is very controlled uh, surgery. This involves operations in the stomach without infection. Uh, uh, non-infectious gallbladder surgery. These fall under the clean contaminated category. If the, these organs are infected, they are inflamed, but there is no fresh pus collection. There is a breach, breach in major sterility technique and a little bit of gross spillage. This defines a contaminated wound. An acute cholecystitis surgery is a contaminated surgery. Perforated duodenal ulcer without peritonitis is a contaminated surgery. And the worst is a dirty wound. This is operation in a cavity that already has full-blown infection or pus collection or traumatic kind of wounds. The reason I'm showing you this table is for you to look at the risk of infection. Clean surgery, the risk of infection is 1%. Clean contaminated, about 3%. Contaminated, about 6%. And dirty, about 7%. And now, now look at the infection if you are not using antibiotics. It almost triples in, during dirty surgery. In fact, it's five times increased. But in clean wound, in clean surgery, whether you use prophylaxis or not, the risk of infection is less than 1%, is less than 1%. So one trick 
in not a trick, in fact, a routine practice we need all, always to do is explain the risk of surgical site infection to patients based on what procedure we are planning to do. In preparation for this, for this uh, uh, talk, I reviewed quite, quite, quite a number of publications in India uh, uh, globally. These publications deal with antibiotic prophylaxis, skin preparation, the, the situation in the operating theater, hand hygiene, and a lot of other, other uh, measures that help in infection prevention. However, I just wanted to you to, to draw your attention to where these papers are coming from. A majority of these are from the developed world. Only 20 are coming from the LMIC countries, from the 125. So you can, you can somehow imagine how incomplete this discussion is going to be, especially since we are using data imported from the developed world. Um, I, don't, I don't think I need to, to uh, go deep into describing what the difference between a developed and a developing scenario are, but drawing serious conclusions based on data from the developed world is a bit difficult. So I'll try to localize my, 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 my discussion to what's available in, in Africa and in Ethiopia. SSIs are a result of three interrelated factors what we call patient factors, pathogen organism factors, and the surgical process factors. Let us look at the patient factors. SSIs are common in the following uh, group of patients. Those who are with advanced age, particularly above 65, the presence or absence of shock, hypoperfusion of the surgical site, Diseases and metabolic states that promote malnutrition and immune, the subsequent immune compromisation like diabetes, malnutrition, alcoholism. Drugs that compromise immunity like steroids, chemotherapy, immune suppressions. And local factors around the surgical site that promote delayed bacterial clearance, situations that give food, for bacteria to overgrow and create barricades for prophylactic antibiotics uh, from reaching that site, like uh, wound hematomas, seromas, the presence of a foreign body, uh, necrotic tissues around the surgical site, and the presence of obesity. Literally all surgical sites will have bacteria in them by the end of surgery. Literally every surgery. Now the question is, will the body eliminate this bacteria before they establish and result in, in infections? Hence, the higher the bacterial load, the likelihood that they will overpower the human body. The second group of risk factors involve the surgical process, the type of procedure. As we have said, clean surgeries have less than 1% of risk of infection. Dirty surgeries are above 40. The degree of contamination, the risk of operating on an acute appendicitis, simple appendicitis versus operating an appendicial abscess. The risk of infection is very high when, when you're operating on an abscess. The longer the duration of the procedure, the likelihood the infection is going to increase. And the urgency of the operation. Urgency is reflected by, is, is tightly related to the reason the surgery is done. There is no time or place or the situation to implement all surgical infection uh, policies, implement them correctly. And the more urgent the, the procedure is, the likelihood the patient is in a very compromised state, as in bleeding, shock, peritonitis, severe infections, trauma, and so on. One interesting fact I, I would like you to probably look at is the risk of reinfection during secondary wound healing. Uh, as you uh, or know or remember, we don't encourage immediate closure of the wound when there is a diagnosed surgical site infection. 
So if you diagnose a surgical site infection, open the wound, clean the wound, do all the necessary care, and re-suture the wound, the likelihood of reinfection is 50%. If you delay the closure by two days, the risk of infection reduces down to 20%. Delaying it by four days reduces to 5%. Again, delaying it by more than a week, the risk climbs, reaches 10% by nine days. Therefore, the message here is that the, the way we handle a healing surgical wound, the timing of our surgical site closure matters when it comes to the risk of infection development. Therefore, aim for the fourth or the fifth day to resuture a healing infected, infected wound. Since the time uh, of recurring surgical site infections in the 1980s until now, the, the, patho the, the pathologic flora that caused Infections remain the same. They are mainly Staphylococcus aureus, still now, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a few gram negatives, Ischia coli, rarely anaerobes, rarely anaerobes. But Staphylococcus, the coagulase negative or the positive, account for one third of all surgical site infections. Anaerobes less than 10%. This is true across the world. And most of the times, these infections, the uh, bacteria, usually comes from the patient's uh, endogenous flora, the skin adjacent to the incision. More than 90% comes from the patient's skin. However, infections can come from the operating table, the head light, the surgeon, the nurses. Uh, from neighboring patients, from the ventilators, from the uh, room fan. There is only one reported case of HIV transmission from a dentist to a patient. And there, there are only very few hepatitis B cases reported from uh, surgeons to patients. Hence, overwhelming majority of cases, the infections usually come from the patient, him or herself. So, what determines who gets the infections? If we say all surgical sites are contaminated by bacteria at the end of the procedure, which patients develop infection? Four important things determine this progress. The first one is the amount of bacteria. The more pus, the more bacteria, the more organisms you expose the wound to, the likelihood the infection will be. The more virulent the bacteria are, as in gram positive, more of gram negative staph aureus, the likelihood of the infection. The presence of conducing, conducive factors like hematoma, seromas, dead tissue, foreign bodies around the wound site, ischemia around the wound site, and the integrity of the host defense system, both innate and acquired and local and systemic, play a part in the development of. SSIs. Um, the, when I try to do risk stratification of all the risks mentioned in the literature, these three stand out. These three risks stand out Im immensely. That is operation that, that are classified as contaminated or dirty, carry the highest risk of wound infection, ASA class two, the more sick patients are, the more comorbidities they have, the likelihood they will have infections, and the longer the operations are, particularly more than the 76th percentile of the surgery being done. So these three stand out as the most important independent variables for the development of SSIs. So how can we reduce and control SSIs. What are the measures we can, we, can, we can do? Again, this rotate around the patients, the surgery, and the pathogens. And we can strategize along preoperatively, intraoperatively, using antibiotics and enhancement of the host defense mechanism. So what can be done preoperatively to reduce the risk of infection? 
The first one, don't operate on orally infected patients unless you are forced to. Don't operate on a gallbladder that's infected, that has pus, if there is a chance of treating it medically. Don't operate on a skin that has cellulitis or a patient with tonsillitis or infection somewhere. Postpone infections as much as you can. If patients have an open wound, or if the operating team have infections in their hand, postpone the procedure. Don't depend on gloves. Reduce the preoperative hospital stay. Because the more they stay in the, in the hospital, the more exposed they are for notorious organisms in the world. Unfortunately, this is something patients do not understand. When we try to admit them the day of the surgery and try to discharge them immediately after surgery, it sometimes seem as if we are dealing with finances. Unfortunately, it is about surgical site infection prevention. A day before the surgery, use plain soap or antiseptic soap to wash the, the body, take a full shower and scrub the surgical site. Do not shave the hair, but use clippers. In Amharic, what we call tondos. Clip the, the, the hair right before the surgery. When we talk about skin preparation, I will talk about the chemicals that we routinely use and the surgical team needs to use routine cups, masks, surgical gloves. Equipment should be well sterilized. Tissue should be handled very gently. Uh, there should not be any excess bleeding or seroma collection to, 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 you know, to get rid of the food the bacteria want. If you avoid dead space, blood and hematoma cannot collect there and bacteria cannot superinfect it. And to drain, you know, any, uh, 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 unnecessary collections when you put in surgical drains, use a separate stub. Don't use the surgical site. If there is overt infection, leave the skin open. Don't close it right away. Wait at least four days until the infection closes and use proper uh, wound dressing techniques when we do uh, wound care. I'll talk about antibiotic prophylaxis in a few seconds, but enhancing the host defense mechanism is a very important thing we can do. Number one, increased oxygen delivery. Very good chest physiotherapy and breathing exercise before surgery, good oxygen during and after surgery, good physiotherapy after surgery increases site, tissue site perfusion. Optimize core body temperature. That the theater is usually cold. Cold environment exposes vasoconstriction, uh, causes vasoconstriction in the skin, hence decreases uh, blood supply to the skin. So by avoiding uh, hypothermia, by optimizing the core body temperature, we can facilitate a perfusion of the surgical site. Obviously, control glycemia malnutrition and anemia that compromise the host defense mechanism. Since the 1950s, since the advent of uh, 1921, since penicillin was identified and the advent of anti-TB drugs, INH and rifampicin, surgical site infection has gone down significantly, dramatically, mainly because of antibiotics use. When we use antibiotics, the principle of antibiotic stewardship need to be followed. Stewardship is nothing but right timing, right delivery, right dose, and right drug. So when it comes to surgical site infection prevention, this is exactly what we are talking about. Administer antibiotics intravenously within 30 minutes of skin incision. The idea is for the uh, uh, antibiotics to enter the blood circulation, reach the liver, get metabolized to its active form, recirculate it back to the entire body, get accumulated under the surgical site, 
and be ready to act by the time you make an incision. So administering antibiotics immediately before surgery is too late. There will not be enough concentration in the tissues to fight infections. If you administer it an hour earlier, the drugs are already metabolized. The body is on, in the process of getting rid of them. So within 60 minutes is what's advised at the moment. And there is no need to redose, repeat the dosage, unless it's a very long procedure or unless there is too much blood loss. Too much blood loss, the antibiotics go out with the, with the blood, the bleeding. You lose the antibiotics with the blood. Therefore, you have to give another dose. And the literature does not agree on whether to continue with antibiotics after surgery, especially in contaminated and clean contaminated procedures. No need to continue one or two doses after the wound is closed because there is no literature that supports, that supports such, such a practice. Antibiotics should be weight-based. We routinely give one gram of safe triaxone. Is that enough for a 40-year-old man or 110 kilograms man? I'm afraid not. We need to use the appropriate weight-based calculation, 50 kilograms per kg. So a 60 kilograms man probably needs a two gram of ceftriaxone if, if, if you're using ceftriaxone, not the routine one gram of ceftriaxone. And when used appropriately, we have data locally in Africa that shows SSI can be reduced by more than 80%. Therefore, the administration of antibiotics is the single most important thing you can do to reduce the risk of surgical site infection. Now the question is, what kind of antibiotics to give? Is, is our practice in Ethiopia, safe tracks on for everybody, is a correct practice? I am I'm afraid, I'm afraid not. There is no data to support safe tracks on is the right drug. So if you have data from your hospital or in Ethiopia, you choose those drugs, otherwise follow agreed upon guidelines in the world, like this one. This is from the CDC. Recently, augmenting uh, ampicillin and clavulanic acid are the drug of choice when we deal with, you know, very uh, uh, critical surgery, vascular, orthopedic, esophageal, uh, and gastric procedures. People still use cefazolin, second generation cephalosporins for biliary surgery. And they combine metronidazole when the small or the large bowel are involved. So our routine practice of just safe triaxone falls significantly short of what the global recommendation is. I also tried to look at some data from, from Ethiopia. From GMA University, the commonest organisms isolated are Staph aureus, E. coli, Proteus, and uh, uh, coagulase negative Staph aureus. Resistant to almost everything. Ampicillin, ceftriaxone, uh, all antibiotics. Susceptible mainly to vancomycin and amikacin. Amikacin is not a healthy drug in humans. Vancomycin is very expensive and has quite a bit of side effects. We have to deal with those with low index of resistance, like norfloxacillin, ciprofloxacillin, and gentamicin. Another data from Hawassa Hospital. Similar organisms, Staph aureus, Klebsiella, E. coli, Pseudomonas. Resistance, 97% to at least one antibiotic. 92% from two to six antibiotics. Some degree of sensitivity to vancomycin, norfloxacillin, gentamicin. Felagehewot, Bardar, the same organisms, Staph aureus, Proteus, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas. Multidrug resistant, as high as 97%. Some degree of usability of gentamicin, encephalotin, erythromycin. And remember, 
de novo, uh, in vivo and in vitro sens sens sensitivity of, of antibiotics also plays a part. More data, uh, Tigray, uh, either same organisms, Staph aureus, Klebsiella, coagulase negative, uh, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas, resistance pattern, exactly the same. Very high resistance for ampicillin, tetracycline, ceftriaxone, cefazolin, amoxicillin. The Black Line Hospital, the antibiotic uh, use is in fact half hazardous. 8.7% received prophylactic antibiotics when they should have received one. And eight, almost 89% continued the prophylaxis as a treatment for more than 24 hours. The commonly used antibiotics are ceftriaxone with or without metronidazole and ampicillin. But the degree of resistance is very high. Does say no difference. Same uh, type of medications, same type of resistance, same type of, of sensitivity. When we talk about skin preparation, uh, skin preparation of the patient and the surgeon, data shows that alcohol-based scrubs are most efficacious. Plain soap and water is the least efficacious. So the current trend is to use antiseptic solutions that contain alcohol in them, alcohol in them. However, in, in setups like ours, where we depend on plain soap and water, use them appropriately, make sure the hand is dry, and apply an alcohol gel into it. The patient's skin, no shaving of the hair, particularly a day in advance. That is a completely abandoned procedure. But clip the hair on the day of the surgery. Patient skin preparation by chlorohexidine, by alcohol, or by povidone iodine. The benefit of povidone iodine is it can be used on the mucous membranes like the vagina, the rectum, the eye, the, the open wounds. The trick is don't wipe it out. Wait until it evaporates on the patient's skin. The patient's skin absorbs what's there. It's a bit toxic for newborns, but gives you a high chance of reducing the surgical site infection. There are some gadgets we wear in the operating theater, the surgeons, the nurses, like gowns, gloves, and masks. They're supposed to protect the patients from our bacteria and to protect us from the patient's fluid. However, there is no substantial data in the world that prefers disposable versus reusable gowns. So what we have in Ethiopia, the reusable gowns are perfect. Just make sure they are well autoclaved, they are dry when they come out of the autoclave. The autoclave mark is there and they don't have any holes in them. You don't necessarily have to have the disposable, these brand new expensive uh, gowns. However, if a glove, I mean, if, if a drape or a gown is wet, it is not sterile. Gloves are proven to reduce infection of the surgeon and of and the patient. However, they perforate a lot. More than fifty-five percent of uh, of gloves we studied uh, in in at the black line in the Menelik end up being perforated. Therefore, double glove when you can. And when there is perforation, or, or if you are suspicious that there is perforation in the middle of the surgery, change it, change it. However, the data is still conflicting globally. Systematic reviews, uh, uh, case control studies, clinical trials are not conclusive. Whether you should use double gloving or single gloving. The weight is towards double gloving, so I would advise to use the double gloves if you can. However, recently data is coming out that routinely changing gloves when you, when you are about to 
close the surgical site is highly recommended. It results in significant reduction of surgical infection, particularly during abdominal surgeries. So when the surgery is done, ghost count is done, when you're about to close the fascia, change both gloves. Recently published data at the Lancet confirms, kind of states that this is a good, good practice. Masks, capes protect us, at least theoretically, at least we look, we look good in them, but there is no difference in the, risk, the rates of SSI between the type of capes you use, the color, whether they are handwoven or uh, hair nets or clothes made, there is no substantial difference. Again, with masks, whether you use uh, I-95, N-95, regular mask, there is no difference in the risk of SSIs. However, there is recent data, not so recent, since 1996, recommended by the American Institute of Architects about the design of the operating theaters we are using. If we keep the theater a bit colder with humidity of about 30% and gentle flow of air from the center of the operating table to the periphery, air changing every 15 minutes and coming from the center, going to the windows and the doors. In other words, what we call the lamellar airflow kind of theater setup, infection can seriously be reduced. And this is the data, mainly coming out of orthopedic procedures. The use of ultra clean air reduces surgical infection from 3.4 to 1.6. If you add antibiotic prophylaxis to it, it goes down to 0.7%. Therefore, the way we design surgical uh, operating theaters and coupling them with antibiotic prophylaxis reduces the risk of infection by 200%, by 200%. Now, <clears throat> how do we treat a surgical site infection once it's diagnosed? As we discussed earlier, the majority of SSI these days are being diagnosed after discharge, mainly because we, we discharge them early. Something must have changed in the past 20 years. Infection is delayed. The bacteria probably have, have changed their, their genome. Uh, the antibiotics we are using are very potent. They delay infections. Therefore, proper wound surveillance is critical. Wound surveillance can be done by direct observation of the wounds. You can call the patients back to us, or we can appoint them to be seen by residents or, or, or nurses or community health workers, but they have to be uh, uh, surveyed. After surgery, since epitalization takes place immediately in the, in the 24 to 48 hours period, the wound can be removed on day two, exposed to air, to dry, no need to apply wound dressing again, and there is no need to put on a, a glove when we inspect clean wounds. There is no evidence that supports us to wear either clean gloves or sterile gloves, unless you know, we are really psychotic about it. If we find such symptoms, clear purulent discharge from the wound, or a closed wound suddenly starts to open up, the suture or the stapler gets sucked in, patient complains about worsening pain in the wound site. Remember, as wound heals, pain should decrease. Patients should be comfortable with their wound. When there is discharge or foul smell, or when there is erythema, we need to diagnose surgical site infection. And as I said earlier, be generous in the diagnosis of surgical site infection. Overdiagnosis is better than misdiagnosis and patient harm. Once we diagnose wound infection, it should be opened. There is absolutely no treatment called closed wound management, absolutely none. All wounds should be opened, remove staplers, sutures, 
open it widely, remove all the pus, irrigate, clean, and dress. Luckily, abscess is a sign of wound healing. When abscess develops in a wound, it shows its healing. The, the fight between uh, the human and the organisms in the patient's favor. So as soon as you let the pus out, things start to, to stabilize. However, if patients are septic, if they are fever, tachycardia, and symptoms, they need antibiotics. Antibiotics. As a summary, as a summary, there are things we, surgeons, GPs, nurses, practitioners can do to protect our patients preoperatively. Encourage all patients to wash, to take a shower, not just a surgical site, with antiseptic soap the night before surgery. The day of the surgery, clip the hair on the table, preferably. Do not shave. Clean the surgical site with alcohol-based solutions or povidone iodine and let the, wound, the, the solution dry up and use appropriate surgical site infection prevention measures like putting on own gloves and hand scrubbing. Perioperatively, oxygen is critical. That is the reason. Even if you are doing a minor procedure, we put the patients on oxygen. Don't uh, expose them to hypovolemia or shock because the skin is the first organ to, be, uh, to have a decreased blood supply. Maintain hypo normal glycemia, maintain normothermia, very critical. And antibiotics are critical, particularly for clean contaminated, contaminated in dirty wounds. Use the most appropriate uh, antibiotics based on the guidelines you have in your hospital. Within 60 minutes of incision, not immediately before incision, do not repeat unless necessary and do not go beyond the immediate post-operative time. So the take home message from my talk today. SSIs are very common, very common. They kill. One third of surgical mortality is linked to SSIs. They have long-term sequelae and they are very expensive to treat. And in a country like Ethiopia, like ours, where uh, patients pay out of pocket, this is an unplanned, unwanted, and unmitigated expense. The numbers look similar across Africa. Our risk of infection is very high, between nine and 23%, whichever country you go to. And there is no market change between the 1980s and now. So something is going wrong. 60% of infections are preventable, or they are preventable. Follow the signs. By the signs, I mean a couple of years ago, vaginal swabbing with antiseptics before cesarean section was declared a good way of reducing surgical infection. Not anymore. It's no more the practice. Administering antibiotics together with anesthesia drugs was the preferred administration. Not anymore. The science has changed. Cefazolin was the preferred uh, prophylactic antibiotic some 10, 20 years ago. Not anymore. Augmentin is now coming up. So follow the signs, follow what's coming up routinely and adhere to the known principles of uh, site prevention. Common things are always common. Gloves are gloves. Don't overthink it. Scrubbing is scrubbing. Don't overthink it. It is essential. And unfortunately, in our practice, once patients develop surgical site infection, they don't come to us. They lose trust in us. They label us the surgeon who gave me that infection. And they go to the second, the second doctor. So surgical site infections are one reason why a nation loses trust in its practitioners. 
And it's not about the practitioner, it's about the patient. Let us make sure patients are uh, aware of the risk of infections they are getting into. And if infections develop, let us help them get better as soon as possible. With this, I uh, conclude my talk. I managed to review a few uh, literatures. I'll be happy to share this uh, 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 materials with you if necessary. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Abu. I can see the comments in the uh, chat box. They were saying it was excellent and well summarized presentation. Thank you very much. As you can see from the emojis as well, <laughs> there are multiple thumbs up. So we can, uh, like you can take coffee or water for like two minutes. We'll be sharing the form right now so that they can fill the attendance. Yes, Dr. Meron has shared it right now. Please make sure to um, make sure to uh, fill in the uh, attendance as well as answer 50%, at least answer uh, out of the five questions. If you get 50%, we will be uh, giving you the CE units and make sure to be patient with us to be sharing the certificates. So, uh, Prof, can we give them just two minutes to fill in the answers? Yes, and we can proceed with the Q&A. And meanwhile, if you have any questions, you can write it in the Q&A box so that we can uh, ask Professor Abba. I've shared it again. And we have also shared the link tree to join uh, yet in our platform so that you can find uh, the PowerPoint. We'll be sharing the PowerPoint uh, today in the yet in our YFP yet in our for health professionals uh, group. Uh, you can get the PowerPoint from there. So I think we can do the Q and A. All right, we'll be proceeding to the Q&A sessions. Uh, I think we have around seven questions. Uh, so starting from the first one, uh, it says, what are the seven causes of infection? Um, in relation to that, what are the stages of infection? So maybe you can answer those two and then we'll proceed to the next ones. Uh, can you hear me, Professor Abba? Uh, yes, yes. Oh, you want me to respond to the two questions? Question? Yeah. Uh, I read what are the seven causes of infection? Yes. Well, I'm not really sure I understand the question, but uh, in a surgical site infection, you, you cannot talk about a cause. Uh, you can say alcohol causes liver cirrhosis. There's a direct link between alcohol and cirrhosis. But surgical site infection is an interplay of three factors, post factor, the, the surgeon factor, and the environment factor. You cannot specifically point, this is the cause of, of the infection. So uh, I'm not sure I can respond. I can, I can respond. I can respond that. Organisms are involved, several organisms. One thing we can we can add here is that gram negatives do not cause abscess collection. You probably know this from your basic sciences. Gram negatives are associated with lipopolysaccharide release, the endotoxin release, and they result in uh, what we call the SIRS, the tachycardia, fever, uh, symptoms of uh, sepsis. It's when they are associated with either a gram positive or an anaerobe that abscess develops. That is why wound infection is not commonly caused by gram negatives. You don't culture gram negatives from the wound because inherently gram negatives don't cause abscess, don't, don't result in abscess. The stages of an infection, well, I can talk about the, the, the stages of wound healing. I can't, we can, you cannot talk about stages of an infection. There is colonization, uh, uh, subsequent inflammation. Uh, you know, all sorts of pathological processes can be there. But in a typical uh, uh, SSI, you cannot talk about stage of SSI. You can't talk about the stage of SSI. All right. Uh, 
other question is what's the science behind shaving and increasing the risk of face size? And does it have to do with bleach in the skin that led to easy entry of stuff for us? Yes. <clears throat> when I was a medical student a long time ago, the practice was uh, to shave patients the night before. That completely changed the past 15 years. We no more shave patients. And right on the table, 10 minutes before surgery starts, the surgeon or the nurse uses a clipper and shaves the hair. That is the practice. Now, shaving results in micro cuts in the skin. These several micro cuts are auto immediately covered by serum, which coagulates immediately and seals the bacteria while the, it's underneath. And the seroma is, is full of food for the bacteria. It flourishes. As soon as you make incision in that traumatized skin, you can be very sure that infections will take place. So to avoid these micro cuts, micro abrasions, we don't recommend uh, 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 shaving before surgery. The signs will probably change in the future. You probably will not also be uh, recommended to use uh, clippers. Chemicals might come that may dissolve the skin, that, that do not interfere with the root hair, and do not, that do not disturb the, 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 the staph epidermidis flora in the skin. But so far, the data we have is don't shave, clip it immediately before, before surgery. All right, um, we have other three questions asked by an enthusiastic listener. So the first one says, currently we use uh, uh, prophylactic antibiotics just before incision for any major surgery, uh, be it clean surgery like thyroid, breast, etc., or any other types of major surgeries. Based on your recommendation, no prophylactic antibiotic for clean, clean wounds. So are we practicing wrong or what's your opinion? Yeah, Shimon, it's an interesting question. You're putting me on the spot. Uh, now, look at the literature. There is ample evidence since the 1980s that persistently show there are some surgical procedures that whether you give antibiotics or not, the risk of infection is less than 1%. These are the clean uh, surgeries. So whether you give antibiotics or not, you are not going to influence the surgical, uh, the risk of infection development. So I leave the conclusion to you, but I don't. I don't give antibiotics for my clean procedures because there is data out there. It's a question of digging it out and utilizing it. If it's clean contaminated, contaminated and dirty, the risk is four, seven and 40%. Antibiotics significantly bring it down from 40% to 7%, from 21 to 4%, which is huge. So I would leave that, 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 that decision to you. All right, so the other question again from Schmelis is from the literature you discussed, the prevalence of ACSI is mentioned in a general term. Uh, we don't know what percentage of clean ones got infected. Uh, we don't know how much of those ACSI are contaminated or dirty ones. I would be more interested in how much of clean and clean contaminated ones uh, acquired infection uh, than the contaminated and dirty ones. Could you elaborate on this, please? Yes, that's a great question. Let me reshare my slides again and uh, show you the slide I showed earlier about <clears throat> classification of wounds and the risk of infection. The data is there. We probably have not seen it, but it's there. It's there. If you, if you go to PubMed and look for surgical site infection, uh, systematic review, or evidence-based, you will get this data. Claim surgery, the risk of infection is less than 1%, less than 1% with or without antibiotics. Clean contaminated without antibiotics is 10%. With antibiotics is 3%. Contaminated 
the risk is 10 to 20% without antibiotics. It is 6% with antibiotics. Dirty from 40 to 7. Now, remember the risk of infections we cited for Ethiopia. 8, 14, 21, 11. Do you realize that it's not even in any of these categories? That we are way beyond the risk of infection of dirty wounds? This is what I, I, I would like you to really concentrate, concentrate on. So the data is there. The data is there. And your second question was about, uh, we don't know the prevalence of wound, clean wound. In Ethiopia, the study is not yet done. Most of our studies are cesarean section based. The, mode, the methodology used is that patients are followed in the hospital for a few days. If they develop the infection, they are, the culture is taken, they are treated. If they go home, they receive a phone call from the researchers. And if they have an infection, they come back and culture is done. That is the surveillance model we have used. How about art artificial intelligence? Can't we think about uh, artificial intelligence in wind, wind, wind infection? Can we think of uh, a mobile phone, a smartphone-based application that can be used by the patients themselves? They take a picture of their own skin, their own wound, and send it to you, the surgeon. Or the AI tells them, reminds them, oh, this looks like this looks infected. Go back to your doctor. Or call your nurse. If we use such a system, if we use such a such a such an infection surveillance system, I, I, I tell you, it is really going to go high. And the third reason is patients, once they develop infection, they don't like you, they hate you. It's a fact. I've practiced in the country for many, many years. I've been uh, you know, 18 years as a surgeon. Once they develop infection, you are, are labeled as the surgeon who gave them the infection. They prefer to go to another doctor. So you don't even know your risk of surgical site infection. That is why the majority of the data coming out from Ethiopia and Africa, number one, it's very limited. And three, it's unreliable. It's always hospital-based. These are the two reasons. The third right, question. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. You can continue. It's okay. Uh, it's about uh, duration of treatment for dirty and contaminant. Seven days, minimum seven days. Particularly if there is evidence of SIRS. The presence of SIRS, in fact, is a dangerous sign. If it's just wound infection a discharge, pus, or dehiscence without tachycardia or fever, it's okay. The wound is healed, the infection is healing. The body has already taken care of it. All you have to do is assist it. Open the wound, make it aerobic. Anaerobic bacteria will not grow there. Mechanically wash it once or twice a day because debris, uh, the pus, hematoma, favor bacterial regrowth. Sometimes use uh, elements that can kill the bacteria, like povidone iodine. I've used papaya mixed with uh, sugar. The sugar helps the, the, the bacteria in the papaya to, to ferment. When it ferments, it helps them grow. That's a good antiseptic. I've used honey. Honey, not the honey you buy from a supermarket the refined heated one. The heat denatures the enzymes in, 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 uh, in honey. So use the honey from, from the countryside. That is very helpful. If you have a Klebsiella or a Pseudomonas infection, use vinegar. Vinegar used for uh, uh, salads. You clean the wound with that. It's very effective. You're mainly mechanically washing the wound. The body has already taken care of the disease. Okay. 
All right. The other questions we have is when is the exact time to start uh, to, to start to say SSI from the operation time? And can we say SSI in immediate or first post of day? And if from, the incision, from the incision, the incision is uh, uh, time zero. Uh, it's called ground zero. From your incision, the first day is called the immediate post operative day, then the first, second, third. But from the incision, you count as zero and you, you, you go onwards. So can we say SSI if an infection occurred in, on the immediate end on the first post of day? Yes, we do. In fact, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned this question. If surgical site infection occurs in the immediate few days, two, three, four days, it's a very serious crisis. You're probably dealing with Clostridium perfringens or polymicrobial necrotizing fasciitis or severe form of infection. Clostridium perfringens after surgery occurs in 48 hours. I have lost two patients, one after perianal abscess surgery, one after simple appendectomy. A fulminant wound infection. So if infections occur in the first few days, take it very seriously, very seriously. All right, the other question is, uh, what's your recommendation with regards to the use of prophylactic antibiotic use with regards to inguinal hernia repairs? Are there many controversy with regards to it? Yeah, thank you, Nabiat. Well, let's demystify this question. You probably will see where I'm getting at. Um, hernia surgery, uncomplicated, is a clean procedure. In clean surgery, you don't need antibiotics. Now, why do you think I used the sentence? It's about the patients, not you, at the conclusion of my, my presentation. I'm just trying to say, don't treat yourself, treat the patient. So the antibiotic probably is your self-assurance that I have done whatever I can to prevent SSIs. You're not influencing the outcome at all. So there is data out there, clearly shows clean surgery, no antibiotics. All right, the final question from Nebiat is currently the National Guideline in Ethiopia recommends uh, cefazolin to be used as a first line of prophylactic antibiotics. So how do you see that? Uh, yeah, that's uh, a challenge. Cefazolin is now uh, challenged by many authorities, particularly in GI-related procedures. Let's start from the organisms you are afraid of. Um, above the diaphragm, the neck, the head, the chest, and aerobes above the diaphragm, particularly you're talking about bacteroids, are sensitive to penicillin. So above the diaphragm, if you're operating on the diaphragm, the, the heart, the lung, the breast, even if you suspect anaerobic infection, penicillin-based medication is enough. So cefazolin might be enough. But under the diaphragm, all anaerobes are resistant to penicillin-based medications, including uh, ceftriaxone. Therefore, for GI, urological, OBGYN, uh, and other procedures, I wouldn't advise cefazolin. And whoever is writing the antibiotic guideline for the country should relook the evidence, relook at the evidence, and probably involve you know, Ethiopia has a lot of uh, experts, a lot of experts in this area. It's better to talk to these people and gather the data globally in, and in the country. But I would be very skeptical with the recommendation of uh, cefazolin as a monoprophylaxis for surgical specific infection prevention. Mm, all right, before I proceed to the other few questions that are left, I want to remind our participants uh, to keep uh, giving answers to the question 
um, forms because it will be ending soon when in the Q and A session. So moving to the other uh, questions that has been that have been uh, forwarded is: um, Is there any recommended number of years or number of times a reusable gown uh, can be disregarded? Uh, sorry, I did not capture you, uh, Dr. Miron. Oh, sure. um, is there any recommended number of years or number of times a reusable gown can be disregarded? No, none. Again, there are two papers that talk about duration of usable gowns, six months, nine months. No, there is nothing. As long as the gowns are uh, well colored, they don't, they're not worn out, they don't have holes in them, continue using them. If it's just one hole, send it for repairs and bring it back. You can't waste them. If they are, uh, you know, defective in a, in, a, in a major way, that's the time to discard them. But there is no, there is no at least agreed upon time frame in the literature about user accounts. All right. Um, so another question is: uh, Most surgeons argue that the OR environment in Ethiopia is not um, ideal, and they still continue prescribing antibiotics for clean surgeries. So I think they're also asking for your opinion regarding this practice. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, this is why young people are the the hope of the of the future. If you have the evidence, you should fight the system. If you see me do things out of tradition or out of you know, my innate fear, you should be able to challenge it. Uh, I left the country many years ago. When I was there, one vial of ceftriaxone was about 250 bir, which was about $10. I mean, who can afford $10 in poor, in a, from a poor African, African farmer? That's a huge amount of money. And Africans don't usually have insurances. So this is how we should look at it. Who's paying for the antibiotic, the unnecessary antibiotic? If it's coming out of the surgeon's pocket or the nurse's pocket, then they will understand. It's, it's a useless practice. And the patients, if they are educated, they will also, they will also resist and ask questions. So I would, I would, I would uh, challenge you to go ahead and challenge the system. All right. Mm, thank you for the beautiful presentation and uh, we'll let the presentation as well. The other question is in regards to what you have just addressed. It's regarding your opinion regarding the um, the misuse of antibiotics. So it has been addressed. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the q &A. Uh, I'm not sure if I see um, yeah, new questions. Um, Can you? Yeah, there are no new questions. The q and as well as on the message uh, on the chat box as well. So if, yeah, there are no more questions. Perfect. Can Perfect. see, yeah. From the emojis, there are multiple reactions, yeah. Thank you very much, our dear attendees. We'll be closing it in just one minute. Um, so make sure to answer the questions and we'll be discussing about the answers in just a few minutes. I can see there are 96 responses until now. Uh, so I think we're good to go. Uh, we'll be closing the forum uh, right now and we can proceed with the questions. Can you share the questions, Doc, or shall I share it? Uh, yes, uh, yes I do you want me to uh, uh, yes if you can that would be great I can. thank you 
Uh, these are very simple questions, huh? <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> they are very simple. Yeah, yes. first one was uh, what percentage of patients develop SSIs? Literature says two to five percent. Ethiopia is eight to 15 percent. Rwanda is about 10 percent. Uh, US is about 0.5 percent. Uh, just to show you, it is a burden in Africa. Something has to be done. Mortality rate from SSIs is 3%. Just because of SSIs, 3% of patients die. Not only that, SSIs contribute to one third of all surgical, surgical deaths. Remember the acute term complications like with the essence, the burst abdomen, and then the incisional hernias, the keloid, hypertrophic scar, the itching, the pain, the restricted movement after, after, after surgery. Treating for SSIs uh, takes time and money. Mainly if you are dealing with deep and organ space infections. Real apparatomies have to be done, Read debridement has to be done, implant has to be removed, new potent antibiotics have to be put in place. So on average, five to seven days is needed, additional admission is needed. Uh, some patients stay months, months and months. 60% of infections are preventable. Now this sword cuts both ways. Number one, there are some infections you can't avoid. You just can't avoid. If you are operating on a patient with generalized peritonitis after perforated colon, tell the patient in advance, you definitely will have wound infection because the risk of infection in the textbooks is 40%. Probably you will have an infection. If you are operating on someone with uh, massive pyomyositis or osteomyelitis, the wound will probably get infected. Don't give them this rosy picture. Oh, you'll be fine. Nothing will happen. It's just an incision in drainage. No, it backfires. And the most important determinant factor for the development or the prevention of surgical site infection is antibiotics. Antibiotics were revolutionary in the way we diagnose, manage, and prevent uh, uh, surgical heart infections. I mean, all A and D are important. Don't disregard them. But the most important, the critical, is antibiotics use. Thank you very much, Professor Abel. Um, so I can see the response on the chat box that they were really happy about the presentation. Thank you for dedicating your time from your uh, busy schedule uh, to give us this talk. I'm sure the people that see it in YouTube videos, they could they would learn a lot as well. Uh, we're really honored. Um, so anyone, you can uh, you can join yet in our on the Telegram group, and we'll be sharing the slide uh, there. And also, you can find uh, the next CMEs and the links on the in our uh, link, the, the link tree that we shared. We'll be resharing it right now. Um, uh, thank you very much, Professor Abel. And I'm sure many of our attendees, their questions are answered. Uh, that was our goal as uh, CME. And I hope we have we will be decreasing the morbidity and mortality related with uh, surgical site infection as because there are multiple uh, operations that are uh, being uh, done right and left in our country. The number of surgeries are increasing. Um, so we're really happy. Um, thank you. I can see Dr. Fitzmaul on the chat box as well. He's saying thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. It's my way of giving back. I really appreciate this. And for your information, some of my students from Rwanda are also in attendance. I'm really happy to see them. See, it's a very small world. Yes. It's a very small world. I'm really glad that this continental working together, integration is happening. If I can be of any support in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out. 
I will share the PDF of the presentation. The slides are a bit heavy for an email. I just shared it uh, to you as PDF. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, our dear attendees and Professor, Abel, and Professor Mark as well. We'll be seeing you in the future sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have Thank a good you. day.